Okay, welcome everybody to another episode of Hollywood Kitchen. And I'm here with author, journalist, and my friend and frequent collaborator, Danny Miller. Hey there. We are in Danny's gorgeous historic house in the middle of the West Adams District of Los Angeles. And tomorrow, September 16th, 1924. So tomorrow marks the 100th anniversary to the day of the day we were gifted in the world with the presence of Lauren Bacall. So she is the star of the month on Turner Classic Movies, which I didn't realize they'd do that, but I planned this already. And I'm just so excited. I love her so much. Um, Same. Oh my gosh, we're big Bacall Same. fans here. Big. Oh, Danny, so I'm going to stand up and they can see the bottom. That's right. That's right. I had to wear my Lauren Bacall t-shirt today. So we are going to talk about her food, her films, her life, and her legacy. So thank you so much for joining us. Can you believe it's her centennial tomorrow? In my mm. aging head, I'm like, oh, 100 years. What is it, Mary Pickford's birthday? No, it's now stars of the 50s and later. I feel like I my brain is from another generation of time than <laughs> my body, which is a weird thing, but it's true. But I love your Lauren Bacall-esque look. I Very try. Look like anyone. I love it. Your hair is perfect. I've always influenced by her style and I didn't realize how much until we were getting ready for this episode and I was searching through my phone and I was like oh here's when I tried to dress like her oh here's when I tried to do my hair like her and I was like she has wielded a greater influence on me than I've realized and so. what an incredible style I was listening to um Evita the other day and remember that great line that Andrew Lloyd Webber wrote in where Evita herself sings um I'm their savior. That's what they call me. So Lauren, but call me. How many movie stars get in a get in a musical lyrics like that? Right. And of course, she's in the Vogue song, Madonna. Right. And of course, she got her start. I mean, she wanted to be an actress, but it was that um, Harper's Bazaar cover that Howard mm -hmm. Hawks saw. That famous cover. Oh, Slim saw it. I heard his oh. wife Slim Hawks was the one who saw it and was like, hey, you've got to bring this girl out here. So I heard that was her her you know, I that saw her. And I mean, there probably are others, but can you imagine just being plucked out of relative obscurity and then her first movie is to have and have not and she becomes an overnight sensation. It's right. just unbelievable. Well, and you know what? It occurred 19. To me. And also getting ready for this episode, you know what else occurred to me? This is the 80th anniversary of to have and have not. Ooh. Right? This year. Why yeah. don't they show it at the festival? They should have. But um, maybe they'll show it to the next one. But what always amazes me about that is how mature and sexy, sexy and confident she is at 20 years old. Yeah. I mean, Although wow. I'm sure you've all heard of how the look started that she talks about in her fantastic memoir, which may be my favorite movie star memoir ever. But, um, oh, Lauren, and there's even a later version she wrote where she added a chapter and it's called By Myself and Then Some. I have that too. And by the way, I read the book when it first came out in the 70s when I was young. And then she also has an audio book. And that's the, you have to listen to her reading it herself. Oh, I defy yeah. anyone, and my wife and I were just talking about it, to hear her read the chapter decades later when Humphrey Bogart dies and not sob. I sob every time. I'm, last time I was walking in Runyon Canyon listening to it crying. But anyway, um, she talks at length in her book and in interviews about how the look started because she was so terrified at 19 to be suddenly starring in this movie. So, and she was shaking and Howard Hawks said, put your head down, you know, like touch it. And then she would look up and that, thus the look was born. Out of fear <laughs> and terror, this look of uh, sexy insolence. But she image. certainly doesn't come off as scared in that movie. She's brilliant in the movie. It's probably my favorite of their three or four. 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 Sure. Um, it's just a great movie by any stretch and boy, and she's not, she, I remember her being asked about, you know, you're, you're, you're tough. And she goes, no, tough isn't the word I use, but just like, she didn't take any guff in her characters in real life. Nor should she, <laughs> nor, should, nor she. should she. And then sometimes she got the reputation of being a little difficult as all women do when yeah. they have any spine whatsoever. But, um, I don't think that's fair at all. I agree. So. Well, one thing, too, is that when you see To Have and Have Not, this is her first movie, and there are rarely times when you see two people falling completely in love on film, you know, and mm -hmm. and that film, when she gets in that 
you know how to whistle, Steve. You, it's just, you just get goosebumps. You're like, he is sitting there thinking, I'm a goner. I'm totally in love with this woman. Like, you just see it right there, you know? And, of course, <laughs> as you all know, in real life, it was a true love affair. Bogey was married at the time, but not happily. And he was very concerned about their age difference. He was 25 years older, and she was like, but, I mean, this was, you know, Look, if we were her friends at the time, we might have said, are you sure he's 25 years older than you? It was the real deal. That was, if you want to look at any movie star marriage and say, well, I don't know. But I mean, that was the real deal. It's not just because he died later, you know, and then like, oh, yeah, that was the one that would have worked. No, it worked. And they were together for quite a while and had two yeah. children, of course. And again, hearing her talk about it, even towards the end of her life, you know, it was just it worked beautifully and it's almost like god that's rare frankly with that much of an age difference but oh, they yeah. were suited for each other oh yeah i read somewhere that bogey went to peter Lorre and was expressing his worry over the age difference and peter Lorre said to him, look if you just get a couple of good years of happiness then that's not nothing yeah I mean, you'd have that so. and they had a lot more than that until he sadly died yeah and i just I love them on screen so much. They're just absolute magic. You can you know? manufacture that chemistry. And it was, I remember reading in her book that Howard Hawks was like, okay, let's see. We are going to put you in this big role, but like, should we, do you think we'll either pair you with Cary Grant or uh, Humphrey Bogart? And she was like, ooh, Cary Grant, ugh, Humphrey Bogart. But they made that decision and then it was just like fate intervened and who who knew it would work? Oh, yeah. They're so Both good. on screen and off. And off. So they did To Have and Have Not, the first film. And then The Big Sleep, which, of course, the plot makes no sense, but it kind of doesn't matter. So it's so good. And then they made um, Dark, I believe, Passage, Dark Passage and then Key Largo right. with John Houston. So they made four films together, all noir, all pretty iconic, too. I think the first two were probably the most. But um, yes, and they were wonderful together. And then she uh, had the two children, and I think she wanted to step out from his shadow as well and prove that she could be a star in her own right and maybe even do other genres. So she yeah. did. And he wanted her to as well. Yeah. So she did drama. She did. Um, I love the uh, How to Marry a Millionaire love. movie with Marilyn Monroe and Betty Grable. That's so much fun. And Shotzi. she And, it, you know, her character. Well, such an interesting character because in theory, her character was just interested in the bottom line and finding, you know, a zillionaire. But then she was such a good actress in that and so funny, too. But you saw like her real self, like it didn't really matter as much as she wanted it to matter. Of course, well, I won't spoil the ending, but it's such a fun movie. Yeah, that's like the, there's like her middle, her early period, her middle and then her later and the the middle, I mean, that that's my favorite. But I also watched on TCM last Monday, because every Monday this month they're showing Lauren Bacall films, um, Written on the Wind, the Douglas oh, Sirk movie. Oh, and Douglas Sirk. It's wonderful film. And it's not, she's great. It's not the flashiest role in it. Um, but, um, you know, Gloria Graham, woo! But uh, it's wonderful. Or wait, I'm confusing that with the, I also watched The Cobweb which I don't like as much as Written on the Wind, but boy, and her chemistry with Robert Stack, and oh my God. Um, so. And let's talk about her name change, because she was born, uh, was it Betty Persky? Betty Joan Persky, Joan nice Persky. Jewish girl, which was not uh, ignored in my Jewish family growing up, like, oh, born in the Bronx. And um, her Bacall with one L, I think was her mother's maiden name. I think so, and they added an L. They added an L, and I think it was Howard Hawks who came up with Lauren, which I don't think she ever adopted in her personal life. She was Betty Bacall. Yeah. Uh, anyone who knew her that called her Betty. But, um, you know, and she said, well, she has that wonderful quote she used to always say in interviews because she opened into Have and Have Not, no one had ever seen her before, and she was a sensation. I mean, huge praise and she ran into Moss Hart the the writer who said to her well you, the only place you have to go is down you know in a good natured way he said that and she said like, it, it was true and she did some films that you know I mean it's but she clawed her her way to the uh, amazing career with lots of different genres I there's not a film 
of hers that I don't enjoy her performance, even if the film isn't that great. One of my absolute favorites that maybe we can get to later, but is uh, Murder on the Orient Express. Oh, yeah. 1974. God, she's great in that movie. Harriet Hubbard. Again, kind of a dual role. I won't get, I won't spoil it if you haven't seen it, but you have to see it. Um, there's lines from that film out of her mouth that I quote on a weekly basis. <laughs> Because uh, she always was so great at playing like tough, broad, but hmm, what's underneath? There's a vulnerability there. And maybe there's even a different thing going on under there, both with Shotzi Page, with Harriet Hubbard in Murder in the Orient Express. And then just to give the overview in her later uh, work, I love her in The Mirror has That's places. That's a movie. And, you know, she was nominated for the Best Supporting Actress Academy Award that year. And should have won. Have, I was going to say, that's another topic for they should have won, yeah. didn't, and it stinks Oscar episode. Yeah. But it was a shock when Juliette Binoche won. It was I like, no. I mean, I love Juliette Binoche, and it's not her fault, run. just like it isn't Greg Kelly's fault. But, um, but she should have won. She got oh. the Golden Globe that year. She did. And then she also did, I think they did give her a Life Achievement Academy. She did, they award, did, I think so. in 2004. But I believe the Mirror History Patients was her only nomination, yeah, which is already a travesty. Yeah, it's crazy. Do you want to talk about her her soup? Let's talk about her soup, yes. Um, I found uh, this in a cookbook where, I think it was a dinosaur cookbook, where the stars sent her, like, their recipes that they like wanted in the book. Signature. Even on the letterhead with her signature at the bottom, which Danny's printed out. And this is for Lauren's watercress soup that she first tasted on her first trip to Paris. Right, a potage cressonniere. Um, and when I first saw the recipe, it's literally just potato, salt, milk, and watercress. And I'm like, you know boring. It's delicious. I had a hard time finding watercress. I, this is watercress. It's, it, it's, it looks like kind of like spinach, but it's more in the cabbage family. I went to Sprouts. I said, oh, we haven't had that in a year. No one wants it anymore. But, you know, it's used, it's, it's from Europe. I don't think it's native to the States at all. I mean, I'm sure it's grown here now, but it's delicious. It's got a delicious, unique flavor, um, delicate, and and then just russet potatoes. Here we go. You just peel them, chop them. I mean, cut them into like quarters, boil them till they're soft, mash them. You heat up some milk, add that to it. Uh, a little salt, a little butter at the end. You, mm -hmm. you chop up some uh, watercress, let it cook in there for really just like five or six minutes. I added some watercress at the uh, on top of it as well some raw watercress let's see if you can see that it's a there's it's a, got lovely green flakes in there and why don't we try it yes my vintage 1939 spoon <laughs> all right let's do a toast to uh to lauren bacall yes on the 100th anniversary of her birth her potage croissonniere mm. isn't that delicious mm. Mm. I have some yummy, oh really gosh. good sourdough bread if you want to have a piece of that. Mm. Oh my gosh. It's really good. So when was the first time you ever recall seeing a um, a Lauren McCall film or performance? You know, it might have been um, when I was a kid, Murder on the Orient Express, or possibly even The Shootist, which is also great with uh, John Wayne. Um, and then I went back. I mean, that was right when I was becoming a classic movie lover. There was a, a theater in Chicago, the Dear Departed Parkway Theater, that played in 35, of course, then two different, a different double feature every single day. Did they have one where you live like that? Um, well, Revival? When I, where I grew up, I grew up, my dad worked in Dallas and my mom worked in Fort Worth because I was originally from Texas mm. before we went to Georgia. But anyway. Once I got my driver's license, that opened up a world for me because we kind of lived in this suburb in between the two big cities where there's no rep revival houses. Mm. But once I got my license, I could drive into Dallas and the USA Film Festival, which shout out to Alonzo Duralde. I first saw him when I was a teenager oh, sneaking wow. out and going to the USA Film Festival in Dallas, Texas. And every Monday night, I guess to counteract the machismo of the football season, they would have a Monday night classic movie at the AMC Lakewood Theater in Dallas. Mm. And I would drive, which is, I think about it now as a teenager driving all the way through Dallas. Like, how did I do that? But I did. 
And that's where I saw the have and have not all about Eve, the women, the innocence. Like I saw so much great cinema thanks to him and thanks to the USA Film Festival who programmed that series of Monday Night Movies. So I think to have and have not on a big screen was my first introduction. Yeah, well, then I saw that. Because it gets, quite frankly. I mean, it's just unbelievable. And, you know, when I looked at her filmography, just thinking about today, it's almost surprising how few films she made because she's so much in our consciousness as like one of the movie stars of all time. And, you know, as you were saying, she did take a lot of, there were, you know, years where she just didn't work at all. And I know that, and she talked about this a lot later in life and in her book, I mean, she was very much, she wanted a career. She always wanted to be an actress and she was very much a feminist, but she also, Humphrey Bogart did make it clear, like, please work, have your career, but let's not be going off on location for months at a time. Like, that's just not going to work. And she totally agreed. And there were years when she had young children that she chose to not work as much, but then she would always come back and do, I mean, think of Harper or, I mean, she was always so great she always had that like other level going on in my opinion that made her performances so interesting they're never her, all her films weren't great but in my opinion she, she always was, was. you know <laughs> I'm another, it's more called discovery for me I go to Noir City programmed by our, our friend Eddie Muller and Alan Rohde every year at the um, Egyptian or wherever they have it and one year they showed young man with a horn oh and so scene. and she plays this really Ooh, woman who's obviously also it's hinted at in the movie a lesbian yep and i think it's pretty overt i mean some people might not see it i definitely saw it but and, well in the book the character was and of course they had to soften okay. it but she gets it in there oh yeah and, and cruel but again and maybe i'm projecting stuff into it but like you see the vulnerability in her scenes it's like okay yeah that's why is he married to her but you're kind of understanding you know her her, um, you know, her simmering misery and, you know, what's behind it. Yeah, there's a lot more going on than what's on the surface. And I think to me, as you have said, that quality she had, I think that is what makes performers interesting, is when there's so much more mm-hmm. below what you see on the surface. Yeah. And in that movie, there's this scene, I'll never forget, the scene where she goes into this elevator and then the doors close and just, it's so foreboding, but it's sexy, but it's mysterious all at the same time. And it's mm-hmm. such a good shot in that movie. And I think it's kind of an unsung Lord call performance, you know? I do too. And opposite, you know, with Doris Day in the movie, I mean, mm-hmm. such a contrast. And yeah. even written in the wind, again, she has the less flashy part. Somehow she conveys, of course, having Douglas Sirk as a director doesn't hurt, but like the, the backstory of this character without it being written into the script. I mean, it's just a really complex performance i loved watching that again last week and i think that's still on watch tcm the app for a while so time for you to catch up on all your lauren bacall films seriously i hope they're showing designing women i assume they will show all those ones i know tomorrow night is i think three of the bogart ones yeah. which of course you have to watch oh yeah <laughs> yeah and she worked with a lot of really great directors too mm-hmm. i mean so many terrific ones now, I know I heard her in later life say, you know, I mean, she was frustrated by her film career that she couldn't always get the films, the great films. And then she went on the stage, she started going on the stage mm-hmm. and just loved it. She thought she was more suited for the stage because she loved having, although to have and have not, I remember her saying, was shot almost in sequence. And that really helped her, especially just starting out oh, yeah. to like follow that emotional through line, but on the stage. And I got to see her, I saw her three times on the stage, which oh, was so heaven, twice in, in Woman of the Year in the eight, early 80s. And boy, and I'm going to say something and I don't mean it in any kind of disrespectful way because I think she was absolutely fantastic. I went back to see it again, then die on Broadway. Um, she can't sing. But she won two Tonys for Best Musical, and deservedly so. Deservedly I mean, so. she cannot sing. Okay, I mean, she she holds the tune, but it's that is not like she's Patti Lapone. She ain't. But by sheer personality, and of course, Woman of the Year is based on the Catherine Hepburn movie, and okay. she's Tess Harding, and it's just a great movie. I mean, a great uh, play. And then the second thing I saw her in was she did it on the West End, and then she brought it to Los Angeles, which was a sweet word of youth. 
which was a yeah. perfect part for her at that age. And again, vulnerable, you know, former movie star who's getting older and so great. But I wish I had seen her. She did Cactus Flower on Broadway to great acclaim. Applause, of course, the musical. You have the of, from that. I do. Yes. From the Los Angeles production of Applause from some, you know, I went to this John Palm estate sale a couple years the ago. The most epic estate sale in the history of where estate sales. All these photos you. came from. Yeah, I had boxes of all the movie stars. I took like a hundred of them. But uh, yeah. Is that a Hirschfeld illustration inside here? Oh, I think it is. Oh yeah, there's, yeah, she's she was the subject of several of those. Oh, remembering her scene in... Um, Sex and the Single Girl. She oh, she yeah. just did so many different kinds of movies. I hate to say that um, probably my two least favorite, and I hate to say it because, I mean, she's still great in it, but because I love the director so much is Robert Altman, but Health and Preda Porte, I just don't think those films worked as much as they should have. Nashville is one of my favorite films of all time. Um, and But I would still watch them again if they were on tomorrow or if they're on the TCM thing, frankly, to see her. Yeah, because she's plays this great character. I've got in health. She's like supposed to be like really old, but then she's doing all these health things that she looks, you know, like half her age. But she was also quite clear about not having plastic surgery. She was like, I think it's ridiculous for people. You know, I was 20 and now I'm not. And I want to look good. I want to be healthy. But she never, you know, she she, she just wanted to be the age that she was and accept it. That's such an interesting point because I feel like when someone becomes a star, the public expects them to be frozen in time at the age when they became a star. I don't know if you've read uh, Baby Peggy's uh, biography, autobiography called Whatever Happened to Baby oh, Peggy. Oh, no, I'd love to. Gut wrenching, mm. I have to warn you. But there's a scene in that where she's older and someone goes, oh, didn't you used to be Baby Peggy? And didn't you used to be cute and little? And she's like, time marches on people yeah. grow up yeah. i mean especially when like, you're a child star it's yeah. the most vicious like you can't be frozen in time as the 20 year old sultry starlet in right. a warner brothers noir and i feel like women probably get that a lot worse because you're judged on your looks you're judged on your age you're expected to be young beautiful perfect flawless you know skinny for eternity and that's just not practical so to yeah. be someone that goes hey that was 30 years ago. Here's what I am today. I kind of really respect that approach to just saying that we're human and this is and as, normal to be older. Right. And, and as fantastic as she is into Have and Have Not and those early films, I mean, you saw her become a more skilled actress as the years go by. And I frankly think like not making endless and she would like turn roles down and the you know, studios were like, you can't do that. And like, well, I'm not going to do it. You know, so that's also, oh, she's trouble because she cared about her career. But I think it also helped. I mean, she almost like reinvented herself every few years. And now she's like the hard scrabble, you know, middle-aged woman. And um, well, I would think that after the Bogart thing, you know, I would think it'd be hard as a woman to be defined by your partner. Like in her case, when you your breakout debut film is mm -hmm. with the person that you fall in love with and are married to, you're kind of forever defined by them. You're no matter how great you are, you're Bogart's wife or you're Mrs. Bogart, you know? Mm -hmm. So I'm sure that like when he died, as much as she loved him, I'm sure there was a, okay, who am I without this person professionally right. and personally? I mean, and she was what, a young widow at like 32 years old. I think she I was mean, young. What do you do with that chapter? And apparently, didn't she have a date a date for a while, Frank Sinatra? Oh, yes. Tell me that story. Well, I mean, from I remember hearing her talk about it, and it's in her book, which you all must read and listen to. Um, I mean, it was something that they were almost engaged, but mm -hmm. she was at a party with Swifty Lazar. And he and, and there was press there and Swifty said, yeah, uh, they're, they're getting married, uh, 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 Betty and, and Frank. And Frank Sinatra, who was just like, you know, horrified at all press attention and would go after people. I don't know. He was so horrified by that and thought that she had spilled the beans and that, that their relationship ended. And then years later, he found out it wasn't her that did that at all. Um, you know, that was not meant to be. I think that was volatile. Of course, she then 
started dating and married Jason Robards, her only other husband. And I think she loved him, but I mean, it was, he, he was, uh, it was, it was raging alcoholism, sadly, that, mm -hmm. that ended up, split them up. They had a child too, who's the only one of the three who's an actor, I think still today. Oh. It's pretty good, Sam Robards. Okay. Um, but, uh, but, you know, it was not, I mean, and that's a thing that can happen too. I, it was just lightning in a bottle with Humphrey Bogart. And no, who could have known, who knows, who knows why that, marriage should be studied because, and he, it was a great marriage. You know, she talks about his flaws and her own, um, but they just helped each other both ways. He was not overpowering to her. He wanted her to have a career. She That's did. so rare, by yeah. the way. Yeah, and she did some of her other work when he was alive and sick, and he encouraged her to. It was never like, you know, drop your career, never. Although he did worry about I me, mean, I think he only married actresses, and uh, but only the, her his marriage with her worked out so beautifully. And that was number four. Yeah. So it took Bogart a while to get there. Yeah, sure. yeah. But and I mean, and I know she had, you know, she it's not great for her that he was married at the time. But, you know, looking at all the stuff from back then, I don't know why, because in other scenarios, then she would have been labeled the homewrecker or something. That didn't happen. Yeah. Maybe it helped that the public first saw her in to have and have not with him. Well, I think the public probably loved the idea of them together. Look yeah. at Pickford and Fairbanks. I mean, they were each married to other people when they started dating, True. but they were Mr. and Mrs. King of Hollywood. Or you know what I mean? They were the king and queen, A-list power. It's like people wanted them together. Yeah. So in spite of the fact they were both married and they both got divorced, which in 1920 would have been a very big deal. But I think that, the public was just willing to give that a pass. Well, like Clark you know? Gable and Carol Lombard. Yes. You know? The public was just willing to go, yeah, I'm just going to look the other way on that one. Yeah, we, we want so. you to be with Carol Lombard. <laughs> yeah, this is clearly the, the right thing for you. And then they had a, her, their first child, Stephen, named after his character in To Have and Have Not. Mm -hmm. And then their daughter, Leslie, who uh, was named after Leslie Howard, who Lauren Bacall always loved. Um, but Stephen Bogart, my God, have you seen him lately? He, he looks, looks just so like, like him. Yeah. It's kind of eerie when you look into the face of someone and you see that person and he did like, so much younger but he's just grown into and 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 she looks so much like her it's so weird yeah. how that works i don't think either of them ever did any acting at all i know for a while leslie was a yoga teacher she i think she ran worked out of that studio on larchmont that i was just at this morning not the yoga but larchmont um but what does he do do you know well i know about one year at the film noir festival um eddie had him there to talk about his parents but also oh, yeah. he had a bogart vodka brand or oh. an alcohol line and he was kind of promoting that and he might kind of do what like some of them do which is promote their family legacy and that's a big part of what they do because some of some of the children of the stars or grandchildren even, they're not necessarily comfortable acting and they might do something totally different for a living, mm -hmm. but just promoting that parent's legacy is like a something they really love. And yeah. we've had a lot of them on the show that do that. So um, yeah. that's great. To me, I would think if your parents are that famous and that iconic, not one, but two, then I would almost want to go be a plumber or do something because you just feel like no matter how great you are or what you do, you're never going to live up to what they achieved. You're always going to kind of live in their shadow. And that would be a really difficult thing to live with, mm -hmm. you know? It's almost like you want to maybe be your own person, have your own identity that's just so different. Unless you know? it's just in your genes to do it. I mean, you know, Liza Minnelli, whatever, Sam Robards, yeah. you know, that's I mean, what he wants to do. And I, as far as I read, I don't think they were against their kids doing that. But yeah, it was only Sam that, that had any interest. I remember the first time I went to New York, I was walking through Central Park and then I just stood at the Dakota. Have you ever been in the Dakota? I haven't been inside it, no. Oh my God. Yeah, uh, uh, and just like, please, Lauren Bacall, walk out. Unfortunately, <laughs> she didn't. But I remember seeing pictures after she died of their apartment there. And it's just like, got such a such a thing in my head of like, oh, I want to be in the Dakota. My wife got to go to the Dakota because they knew her father's agent was Lauren Bernstein's sister. So like, did oh, you see Lauren Bacall? Was she in the home? No. Um, Can you imagine yeah. she's like taking out the trash and yeah. like, <laughs> yeah, there's Yoko Ono. Wait, step aside. I want to see Lauren Bacall. Um, but she, you know, she had a great life after becoming a widow. I mean, she did these plays and she did her movies and um, 
could have won the Oscar, but, uh, Great. you know, had a wonderful career up till the end. Remember she did those movies, um, there was that one, Nicole Kidman in that style where it's very, like, there's no oh, scenery. Oh, uh, Dogville. Like, yeah. Lars von Schier's Dogville. Not my favorite director, but boy, is she interesting in it. Oh, yeah. She always was challenging herself, and she talked about how she, she, she never didn't have some stage fright. She was always nervous, but again, you wouldn't know it because she was really, she just got more and more skilled as an actress. I did well. We've got some funny comments on here. Oh, Karen Hensbury. Hello, Karen. Hey, Karen, Chicago. She says, Watercress, I just soon as eat my way across the front lawn. <laughs> <laughs> I can't say it's that dissimilar from that, but you know. I have some left over and I thought maybe a tea sandwich because they always have watercress in there, a little butter, maybe cucumber. I need to add the shootest to my watch list. I always hear good things about it. Benjamin, we knew you'd be here, Benjamin. Hello. So happy. Couldn't talk. Couldn't talk. Um, add Young Man with a Horn with co-stars Doris Day and Kirk Douglas. We agree. We are with you on that. We love that film. Um, Let's see. Baby Peggy was at the Hollywood show when I was there. Monique. Hello, Monique. I saw her at the TCM Festival, and that was emotional and Me wonderful. Too. Years I, ago, obviously. I have a picture of she and I walking down the hall together at the TCM. And oh, I my God. I'm sure of that because as much as I love silent film, she's the only silent movie star I got to meet. So I was about to just cry my head off that day. And she was very honest about her life and career. She was a delight. Oh, yeah. Um, Benjamin, I see her in the cartoon character Jessica Rabbit as a mix of Bacall, Veronica Lake, and Rita Hayworth. I think Ooh. I think they would cop to that. We saw that recently at the New Beverly, and yeah. And then, of course, remember the, um, what was it called, Bacall to Arms, the great Warner Brothers cartoon that had a Lauren Bacall and Humphrey Bogart characters, very caricature. Love it. Yeah. Classic Warner Brothers. So those are some of the uh, the comments that we are getting here. So, uh, yeah. They had Murder on Express Express. Did you see it at the TCM Festival? It didn't, no. It's, I mean, the, sec the, the recent remake is fine. It's lovely, but nothing compares to, she, and she is the steel of that film. She is fantastic in it. It just gets to use every aspect of her personality and even backstory like oh she's this brassy american or is she um it's just great if you haven't seen the original uh sydney lament i think isn't mm -hmm. it murder or express watch it tonight now you've got a bunch of bacall pictures right danny i do from the famous um john palm box, the Lauren Bacall box that of course we got. And you know, God, I was just looking at this one of her much older and still gorgeous without her plastic yeah. surgery. But most of them are just these, you know, of course she was a model at one point, but then when she became a movie star, I mean, come on. Oh, and here's the famous picture, which just kind of happened at random when she was at an event where um, President Truman was playing the piano, got up on the piano. That's a very famous shot. Here's a, 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 a spread of her eating, which I'm sure she hated this photo when she's putting that in her mouth, but like, <laughs> she always weighed 110, never more, never less. And you know what? I We've done so many people on this show and you have Carrie where like, yeah, they never cooked. And then who, what publicist? I totally 100% believe this is Lauren Bacall's recipe from Paris for watercress soup. She cooked a lot. She, I want, I, I just would want to be in her kitchen at the Dakota. Oh, and she talked about how this was something she ate on her very first trip and yes. how special that was. She loved Paris, which yeah. already makes me love her. Me too. And she loved London. She loved Europe. But this, oh, here's one with <laughs> the ones of her in Bogart. Well, here's one of her with Jason Robards. I'm not saying this isn't posed, but it kind of like depicts their volatile marriage. But then look at her with Bogart. And do you recognize anyone else in there? Just a candid shot of them yeah. being the most beautiful people on the planet. Um, I mean, she just, no matter, just wearing casual, casual clothes at home. I, do you not agree that she was one of the most beautiful women in all of Hollywood? Oh, this is just a small black and white version of the famous Harper's Bazaar. She's dressed as like a, not a nurse, but well, it's like the Red Cross. That is the picture. They've got Slim and Howard Hawks over to see her. And 
they signed her for like a seven year contract. I mean, she mm -hmm. had tried out for some plays and I know she wanted to do the national tour of the Dorothy McGuire Claudia. And I think maybe she tried out for the movie too, which Dorothy McGuire did, but um, didn't get it. So she wanted to be an actress. It wasn't like here, be an actress, but she had like virtually no credits. I think she had one walk on on Broadway when she was signed and starring in a movie at 19. Um, she was a constant cover girl. You know, one thing I love about Lauren's looks among many, her lips. I have such thin yeah. lips. If I want to rock anywhere close to this style, I swear I have to paint them on. Well, these are the lips that unfortunately, yeah, people often try to get, but don't, don't try it at home. Either you're born with them or you're not. Yeah. Confidential agent. Now I have never seen this film. Have you? No, I, Charles but I think I need to track it down now. I think I need to go looking for I it. I was so excited to watch The Cobweb again last week on TCM. It's an odd movie. It's very odd. Watch that. It takes place in like a, 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 a mental health facility. But anything of Richard Widmark, too, though. I love him. Gloria oh. Graham, Lillian Gish. I mean, what a cast. We're going to look for this online, but on PBS in 1988, and here's the ads for it from the time, she did a show about Bogart, which I probably saw when I was young, but I, boy, I need to see that again. It reminds me of the one Catherine Hepburn did years later, also That's on PBS. Crazy. Yeah. Here she is when, like, her applause days. I mean, I want to say she was older. She was middle-aged. Okay, she was 20 years younger than I am now, but... <laughs> But, you know, she, applause is the one that if I could go back in time, I would want to see. Oh, and here she is as the nurse in Cactus Flower. Now in the movie version, Ingrid Bergman got the part. They often switched over roles because I remember Ingrid Bergman did the movie version. Remember the movie from the Mixed Up Files of Mrs. Basil E. Frankweiler about a, oh. a little girl gets like lost in a library or something and she's the librarian. Well, Ingrid Bergman, this was late, much later in her career, did the movie, and then Lauren Bacall did it on TV. Okay. Um, here's a beautiful shot of her with her two children from Humphrey Bogart. Gorgeous kids, gorgeous mom. And, you know, oh, and here's Leslie later. You can see she looks like her. I haven't seen a picture of her lately. And by the way, I did write to Stephen Bogart to try to get him on the show, but I didn't hear back. But that's okay. When both your parents are icons, you probably get a lot of these requests. Famous but I had to try it. Life magazine cover, which is such a great shot from applause. And by the way, there is a YouTube um, segment or a little clip of uh, Lauren McCall doing a coffee commercial when she oh, was in her theater years. Yeah, I, forget, I think it was called High Point Coffee. Yes, yes, it doesn't High exist Point anymore. Coffee. She did a ton of them. And there was one other product. That, well, there was a period of time, and she was much older then. I mean, her voice was so fantastic that it's like she was, if, if, if it wasn't her doing the narration, it was someone trying to sound like her. She must have made a, she probably made more money on her commercials than in her film career. Um, because who wouldn't want her voice? Uh, yeah. uh, someone asked, uh, can you just post a list of the movies you mentioned, specifically the not so famous ones? Uh, sure. Give me time uh, to get home later today, but sure, I'd love to do that. Um, it's really a shame she didn't get that Oscar for the mirror has she faces and she wanted to. I know that's going to be so hard when you are the presumed front runner, the presumed winner mm -hmm. to sit in that audience and be like, Oh my God. And you can't yeah. cry. You can't freak out. You can't get upset. Like I felt so bad for Angela Bassett because it, I thought she was going to win that Oscar. And then when Jamie Lee Curtis did, yeah. like how do you sit there and just be like, well, control yourself? Of and course. Everything? And yeah. And I mean, I bet Angela Bassett will win plenty, but like she should, was, she should have had time you know, by now. Lauren Bacall knew. And again, that part, that was a great part for her and kind of just capitalized on her whole her whole being up until that point but i mean in my opinion it was part of it was i think it was barbara streisand's first movie as a director mirror has two faces mm -hmm. no she did she directed yentl she directed that was one. after i think mirror two faces was like in the 90s I think. oh you're right yeah you're totally yeah. right but, but i still think the academy had i mean i think uh, hopefully they're over it now but i think barbara streisand having directed that didn't help lauren bacall win the oscar also, we have to remember this was the Harvey Weinstein era where Julia Binoche, the English patient, was a right. Miramax film. So 
I wonder how much of the shoving that down the Academy yeah. voters' throats was going on there as well. It's just, and again, I love you know. Julia Binoche. I would I give it too. to Lauren Bacall. She might have been one vote short, you know. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't I don't like those conversations about how things were stolen from someone. It's just human beings in the Academy voting and, you know. You're so mixed on the Oscars. We have this conversation like every year mm -hmm. in an Oscar special. But because I've watched them since I was a little girl and part of me enjoys the pageantry, the history, the hype, the hoopla, the fashion, the mm -hmm. who's going to win. But on the other hand, there are so many artists who richly deserve that honor, who never, ever got close to it. And so many who won that are just completely forgettable. So I feel like it matters, but it doesn't matter. Right. And I feel like ultimately at the end of the day, time is the ultimate decider of what is excellent what is not what yeah. is lasting and memorable and what is not and sometimes um, they really so. get it right like you know Meryl Streep and Sophie's Choice had to win Vivian Lee and Gone with the Wind but you know we can all come up with our own personal like outrage poor Grace Kelly gets it bad because she won over Judy Garland in A Star is Born and in yes. our classic movie community people go after grace kelly it's not grace kelly's fault well, she's wonderful in that movie but... Is, but it was also there's a lot of politics that go into that too and judy had burned a lot of bridges at mgm burned bridges at warner brothers so they're not going to throw support behind her for that they're going to go elsewhere and i think popularity personality politics a lot of that factors in it's not solely about artistic excellence i sure. remember but, being outraged that she was not lauren bacall was not nominated for murder in the orient express now ingra bergman won for that obviously i completely worship ingra bergman in every single way but like that role no and she herself remember she like gave her award she couldn't believe she won and she kind of gave it to some other who was that woman in day for night or something that was also nominated that year but but lauren bacall wasn't even nominated and she yeah. is that film and it was a brilliant performance sometimes i think people thought oh she's playing herself which is always obnoxious and absurd yeah um and also it could have been again there's so much politics behind it it could have been a maya culpa for the way uh that ingrid bergman was kind of treated and they kind sure. of backlash although she won for anastasia that was their although yeah. it was well deserved could have been a double maya culpa. yeah yeah or just like oh this is her last you know this her is her last shot that. gotta give you know I yeah mean, it, you know, again it's, it's just human beings sitting there with their ballots now online <laughs> like i i love the story um I talked to Sarah Karloff for Film Masters for this little mini piece on uh, Boris. And we talked and she said Boris didn't care at all about any awards. That meant zero to him. And she told me that when he got the Grammy for the audio recording of the Grinchy Soulcrits, he didn't show up to get it. His agent got it on his behalf and then presented it to him one day when Boris was at the office. And he just picked it up and said, it looks like a bloody doorstop. And then just put it down at the front door and just walked out. So, like, I think that's kind of a powerful statement because guess what? He may not have had any Oscars, but who do we talk about? Who yeah. do we screen every year at Halloween? Who was the defining person in the horror genre? That would be him. Yeah. So, and I think Lauren Bacall, know. from everything I've read from her own hand, is um, had a really healthy attitude. She was very into her career. It was not just like, oh, I don't care. She cared. But it was more about the work, and she didn't necessarily care that much about. I'm sure she would have loved to have won the Oscar when she was overlooked. But um, you know, she cared about her family. Um, again, just remembering how she was talked about in my house growing up. You know, nice Jewish girl from the Bronx. Um, she and her. She talked a lot about. She didn't. Her father left the family. I think when she was quite young, but she was very close to her mother, who she said instilled values in her and character you know she always worked she never thought of herself as like you know someone who was just looking for a man to take care of her um i just think she had great values i'm sure she could be difficult because she did not suffer fools at all but you know there's a lot of great interviews with her online including later in life and sometimes the interview is really skilled sometimes they're not and she'll call them on it but in a nice way she would say you know i'm just honest and not everyone loves it but i'm not out to hurt anyone she would never like lash out but i don't you know i it, she's an interesting hybrid because you know we can talk about someone like john crawford whose career was like you know everything is about my fan base and everything and i think 
Lauren Bacall cared a lot, but it wasn't her whole life. She wanted more than that. I honestly think the people who had more interests or any or things in their life, I think they were probably a lot happier. Because like I love Betty and Joan very, very much. And we've talked a lot about that. But the thing is, I feel like both of them, their career was everything. Right. And they couldn't kind of let that go at any point. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that was number one in their entire life and everything else was way down that list. Yeah. And people that can kind of walk away either temporarily or permanently, I think, and again, I don't want to be judgmental in any way, shape or form, but I think maybe they're probably a little more well-rounded, mm -hmm. you know, that can kind of go, okay, I had that chapter, it's closed, I'm going to go off and do something else. Or that yeah. kind of film for me is done, but now I'm going to try this. You know, Betty Davis was her favorite actress as a kid. I think the book starts with her talking about Betty Davis and when, but I think it was after Howard Hawks had met her and she was on her way to Hollywood, but hadn't even done a film yet. She somehow got a meeting with Betty Davis in New York. And it's a lovely recounting of that because Betty was like, you know, took her seriously, but said, you know, do summer stock, go do summer stock, go get on the stage. Cause that's when you really learn your craft. And that is what she did. You know, and I just, I'm sitting here remembering like when the curtain first opened and I saw her on stage in Woman of the Year, it was electric. Who cares that she couldn't sing? <laughs> you know, I, to me, there are some stars, even if they can't sing, they can sell a song. Oh, and that's 100%. That is the difference. There is that there. funny story that our friend Carol Cook used to always tell us. She went to see it with um, Ethel Merman. And there was the moment in the big song, I'm the woman of the year. And then you hear Ethel Merman in the audience going, Jesus. <laughs> My son always laughed at that story. Um, but again. <laughs> An episode eventually, that needs to happen. Oh, there we go. All right, I'm going to add that to the list. <laughs> Oh my gosh. But yeah, tomorrow, 100 years ago, it's hard to believe I will be watching Lauren Bacall all day. I don't know about you. I, I will be, yes, I will be. I will be doing that as well. And um, yeah, let me see if there's any other further comments. My mom is watching. Awesome. Mom Aww. always catches these. I love Bible. that. I love that. Now, was she a, a big movie fan? My mom? Mm -hmm. Well, my movies my no one in my family is as cinephile obsessed as me so normally when i go home to georgia i'll find some movie playing at a classic theater or whatever and i'll kind of make my whole family watch it and i'll drag them but then they always have a great time and they always have fun it's just me being like no we're gonna have to see this <laughs> I'm kind of the the annoying. I've uh, seen those pictures of your mom. She had that kind of Lauren Bacall look, as you easily can. Yes, I love my mom very much, and she watches all of these. She watches all of these. So, all right, well, I don't see any more questions coming in. So um, thank you everybody for watching. And Danny says, this is a terrific book. I have it and haven't read it yet. And I clearly need to, I think I want to do the audio version though, because I yeah. can hear her talk. I don't know where I, I assume it would be on Audible, even though it's obviously years okay. old, but okay. um, hearing her read it. And again, I mean, I'm sure there were times in the studio when she's talking about Bogart that she had to stop and, you know, you just oh, yeah. feel the emotion. It's not put on even decades later, but she writes with brutal honesty. I don't even think she had a ghostwriter. Um, she didn't strike me as the type that would have put up with that either. No. <laughs> you know. And it says honest as can be. And if you have a choice, get the myself and then some, because it was later in life and she just added a chapter, like bringing you up to date. Um, I wonder if she edited anything from earlier. I don't know that, but uh, writes about her children, her two marriages, her Frank Sinatra, her career, you know, she uh, her terror on set. Um, it's definitely a great read. Start it tomorrow. All right. Well, thank you, Danny. As always, it's always so much fun to hang out with you. And thank you to everybody watching. Um, I do have a Patreon account, by the way. Um, any donations to that go towards ingredients. Right now, I'm preparing a ton of Halloween episodes. I really, fingers crossed, hope I get to all of them. And um, stay tuned. And please keep following me for more food, fun, and film history from Hollywood Kitchen.